From the time he began studying German in high school, Vladimir Putin probably already had his sights on joining the KGB. He got his wish, and way more. This is the story of Putin's KGB career, a career that took him right into the Kremlin as president of Russia. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin was born in St. Petersburg, Russia, then known as Leningrad, on October 7, 1952. Although his parents Maria Shalomova and Vladimir Spiridonovich Putin had two other sons, they both died as young children. As a result, according to childhood biography, they became protected parents who did the best they could to keep Putin alive and well. Both parents worked in factories after the Second World War, and Putin himself claimed in his official state biography that he came from, quote, an ordinary family. It was a simple upbringing, a communist upbringing. His father was a party member, while his grandfather used to be Stalin's chef. His childhood involved practicing judo and reading spy novels. By the age of 14, he was excelling academically and was admitted to the prestigious school number 281 for high school, where he began studying the German language. Intellectual takeout reveals that around the same time, Putin decided to have a go at becoming a spy and went to a local KGB branch. After asking for an appointment to discuss his future career, the receptionist put him in touch with a dutiful senior agent, who advised him to join the military or study law, but in any event, not to contact the agency again. Five years later, Putin followed the senior agent's advice and went to study law at Leningrad State University. While at university, Putin met Anatoly Sobchak, one of his law professors who would become important in his future political career. During his final year at Leningrad State University, Putin was finally contacted by the KGB. After being put on a probationary track, he officially joined the agency after graduating in 1975. A Wilson Quarterly article, The Once in Future Russia, explains that initially Putin was relegated to a local Leningrad branch rather than being given, quote, a more desirable foreign post. Former KGB agent Oleg Kalunjin claimed that all that office did was harass dissidents and ordinary citizens, as well as hunt futilely for spies. And despite the millions of rubles and thousands of man hours spent, between 1960 and 1980, not a single spy was caught by the local Leningrad KGB. Putin was a, quote, low-level cog. Radio Free Europe reports that Putin's work with the Leningrad branch mainly consisted of recruiting foreigners who came to the Soviet Union and Soviet citizens who communicated with foreigners or were going abroad. In 1983, Putin married Lyudmila Alexandrova Shkrebnyeva, who worked as a flight attendant for Aeroflot at the time. The KGB, which stands for Komitet Gazudarstvenoy Bezupasnosti, was the Soviet Union's intelligence agency, security agency, and secret police rolled into one. Although the modern KGB was established in 1954, it had its roots in the Cheka, established by Vladimir Lenin in 1917. According to PBS, the KGB had their hands in everything, from running the Gulag labor camps to engaging in espionage. The agency conducted assassinations as well, with nearly untraceable poison, often a go-to weapon, according to Big Think. The Atlantic reports that Vladimir Putin was recruited to the KGB by Yuri Andropov, then chairman of the KGB, as part of the agency's attempt to bring in people from different societal groups. During the 1970s, Andropov developed a recruitment scheme to bring some new perspectives into the KGB and create an atmosphere for finding new ideas and dealing with the state's myriad problems. In 1985, Putin received a foreign posting, working in Dresden, East Germany, under the cover of a translator. Although information on his time there is scant, his duties were apparently similar to those in Leningrad. The Washington Post reports that Putin likely sought out East Germans who had a plausible reason to travel abroad, such as professors, journalists, scientists, and technicians, who could covertly link up with agents permanently stationed in the West. But according to Politico, it's possible that Putin had a far more significant role a former member of the Red Army faction, a far-left German terrorist group active from 1970 to 1998, claimed that Putin supported their operations. Since the organization had difficulty buying weapons in West Germany, they'd reportedly pass a list of weapons off to Putin and his colleagues, who would make sure that an agent in the West would set up a drop-off in a secret location. However, since most of the Red Army faction members are either in jail or dead, this claim is difficult to verify. In 2015, however, an investigation by Corrective revealed that Putin likely had more authority in Dresden than initially suggested, possibly responsible for a plan that involved blackmailing a professor with, quote, pornographic material. There's even a suggestion that he took part in an operation tasked with stealing technological secrets. Though little is known about Putin's Dresden assignments, he was rising through the ranks of the KGB during his time in East Germany. The Moscow Times reveals that by 1990, he had become a lieutenant colonel and the year before had been given a bronze medal for, quote, outstanding service to the East German National People's Army. 
The KGB was closely intertwined with the State Security Service, or Stasi, of the German Democratic Republic, or East Germany. The Stasi participated in their own intelligence and secret police activities, but the tie between the two services was so close that Stasi officers were considered, quote, Czechists of the Soviet Union, according to author John O'Kohler. East Germany was also significant for the KGB because it lay on the front lines of the Cold War. It was a place where agents could cross from one side to the other, and it held more than 300,000 Soviet troops and an assortment of Soviet intermediate-range missiles. According to a Stasi defector, the GDR could do nothing without coordination with the Soviets. The Stasi's surveillance operations were instrumental for the KGB. Monitoring hundreds of thousands of German citizens, the Stasis amassed millions of documents, and the KGB kept tabs on those who could take justifiable trips abroad. In the secret Stasi files, over 10,000 people were marked as being, quote, of interest to the KGB. According to the New York Times, in 2018, Putin's Stasi photo ID card was even discovered in German archives. And although this doesn't imply that Putin worked directly for the Stasi, it proves that Putin had access to the Stasi's headquarters in Dresden, most likely for recruiting locals for his intelligence work. As the Berlin Wall came crumbling down, the tide started to turn. It took a month, but eventually the protests reached Dresden. Time magazine reveals that in 1989, German protesters gathered outside Vladimir Putin's office and threatened to storm the building, calling for an end to the Soviet-backed government. In his official biography, Putin claimed that he frantically requested instructions from Moscow but received no reply. The BBC reports that Putin and his KGB colleagues decided in lieu of official instructions, they should simply burn all evidence of their work. Putin himself recalls, I personally burned a huge amount of material. We burned so much that the furnace burst. According to Russia Beyond, the most prized documents went to Moscow, but everything else went up in flames. Although Putin realized that the GDR's collapse was, quote, inevitable, according to The Atlantic, what he regretted was the fact that the Soviet Union had lost its position in Europe. Although intellectually, I understood that a position based on walls and water barriers cannot exist forever. But I wanted something different to rise in its place and nothing different was proposed. That's what hurt. The fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, coming shortly after the end of communist rule in East Germany, was for Putin and like-minded colleagues a crisis of epic proportions. When I say that the fall of the USSR was one of the greatest catastrophes of the 20th century, I'm talking about a humanitarian catastrophe above all. By 1991, Putin had returned with his family to St. Petersburg and retired from the KGB. But in 2004, he claimed that there is no such thing as a former KGB man. On returning to the Soviet Union, Putin initially planned on doing a doctoral dissertation and working at Leningrad State University. But after his former professor Anatoly Subchuk was elected mayor in 1991, Putin joined his team as an advisor and, quote, head of external relations. But according to the two worlds of Vladimir Putin, Putin also continued his work as a spy. DW reports that Putin started working for the St. Petersburg City Hall one year before Sobchak's election. And from his earliest days there, his work came under scrutiny when it was discovered that Putin had permitted the sale of highly undervalued steel in exchange for foreign food aid that never arrived. An investigation recommended that Putin be fired, but his termination never came. From March 1994 to 1996, Putin served as Subchek's deputy mayor. Putin was incredibly loyal to Subchek, and when Subchek narrowly lost the election in 1996, Putin left St. Petersburg. ABC reports that Subchek continued to be Putin's mentor, though, gearing him towards national politics. Putin soon set out from Moscow and the presidential administration. In 1997, Putin was named Deputy Chief of Staff to Boris Yeltsin, then President of Russia. The following year, Putin was named Chief of the FSB, a successor organization of the KGB. According to Radio Free Europe, in 1993, Yeltsin had tried to dilute the former KGB's power by taking the Vimpel Special Forces Unit out of the FSB. But two months after Putin became the new director in 1998, he brought the Vimpel unit back under FSB control. Before long, Yeltsin promoted Putin again, this time to the position of prime minister on August 9, 1999. At the time, Putin was Yeltsin's fifth prime minister in under two years. CNN reports that Yeltsin claimed that Putin was the ideal choice to handle the Caucasus crisis. Putin would eventually stabilize that crisis. Many ended up criticizing his brutal response to the conflicts in Dagestan and Chechnya. It was clear, though, from the beginning that Yeltsin wanted Putin as his successor, and on December 31, 1999, as Yeltsin resigned, he named Putin acting president. The secret agent who became president. Vladimirovich Putin. As acting president, one of the first things Putin did was pardon Yeltsin of charges of corruption that had dogged him when he resigned. 
The resignation, meanwhile, had triggered elections for March 26, 2000. Although Putin had arrived on the political scene as a relatively unknown face, Thotko explains that his law and order platform and decisive handling of the Second Chechen War as acting president soon pushed his popularity beyond that of his rivals. And when the polls closed, Putin was elected to the presidency with 53% of the vote. According to Der Spiegel, after being elected in 2000, Putin went to the old KGB headquarters in Moscow and joked to 300 former colleagues, instruction number one of the attaining of full power has been completed. After becoming president, Putin stayed loyal to his KGB roots. Time magazine reported in 2015 that the group of generals and KGB veterans in Putin's inner circle had started to hold sway over Russian politics. According to The Atlantic, during a National Security Council meeting in 2016, six of the eight people in attendance were KGB veterans. Putin wasn't the only ex-KGB agent to become the head of an ex-Soviet republic. Heder Aliyev, the third president of Azerbaijan, was the head of the KGB's Azerbaijani branch before becoming president. There's considerable speculation as to how much Putin's career in the KGB influences his decision as president today. Many of his outspoken critics have ended up poisoned or murdered, a tactic often utilized by the KGB. NPR writes, Proven or not, the radioactive death of vocal Kremlin critic Alexander Litvinenko hangs like a cloud over Putin's head. Meanwhile, the murder of Anna Politkovskaya is thought by some to have been a way to silence her reporting, which, according to RFI, exposed the Russian president as a power-hungry product of his own KGB history. Let me give you some names. Anna, Anna Politkovskaya shot dead. Alexander Litvinenko poisoned by polonium. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky. Some outlets, like Foreign Policy, claim that with the FSB, Putin has essentially brought the KGB back into existence. Even its full name, the Ministry of State Security, was the same name given to Stalin's Secret Service, which operated from 1943 to 1953. And by combining domestic surveillance with foreign espionage under Putin, the FSB has operationally returned to its KGB roots. In the end, even though the Soviet Union fell, as Catherine Belton writes, the institutions the security men worked in did not break down, nor did their personal networks disappear. Having seen what mass uprisings can accomplish in Germany, in his time as president, Putin has been quick to suppress dissent. As First Post reports, Putin's security forces crushed a wave of anti-government demonstrations in 2012. Currently, the Russian president repeatedly jails opposition leaders and activists. The Allied powers ultimately defeated Germany and Japan in World War II, but that victory was far from assured. What would happen if the Third Reich had won the war in Europe? Would Germany have control of Africa? Keep watching to find out. It's a well-known fact that the Nazis killed 6 million European Jews as part of the so-called Final Solution, as well as large swaths of other vulnerable populations. The genocide ended with the Allied invasions of Germany and Poland at the end of the war as part of the German defeat. Had Hitler and the Germans never lost, the program of organized death would likely have continued apace, presumably on track to kill off much more of the Jewish population on the continent. Horrific as the legacy of the Holocaust has been, could it have been even worse? The Holocaust Encyclopedia, published by the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, put the total Jewish population of Europe at about 9.5 million. By those figures, another 3.5 million people could have eventually been killed, adding even more souls to the already grim tally. The real figure may have been slightly lower, though. The 9.5 million cited included the Jews of the Soviet Union, tens of thousands of whom lived in the autonomous Jewish oblast of Russia's Chinese frontier. These people lived far from Nazi territorial ambition. 9 to 9.5 million people seems like an inevitable, if truly bleak, toll. Hitler was serious about establishing a new German land empire. By 1942, Hitler ruled most of the European continent and huge sections of the Soviet Union as well all the way to the Caspian Sea. And then he's going to turn his attention to the east, which he sees as the natural field for German expansion. Contrary to popular belief, though, Hitler didn't aim to conquer the world. He planned for Russia's Ural Mountains to form the eastern perimeter of the Third Reich. It's unclear, though, what Hitler wanted to do with the UK. The Nazis had planned Operation Sea Lion to occupy the British Isles, but Hitler seemed to go back and forth on whether England belonged in the Third Reich in the cultural sense. Operation Sea Lion would have been a bloodbath if it had ever been launched, but its corollary, Operation Green, the plan to invade Ireland, would have likely gone much more smoothly for the Germans. The Irish Times reports that the Irish army was seriously outgunned, with many of its divisions relying on bicycles, earning them the sneering nickname of Pedaling Panzers. But as in England's case, it's not clear that the Celtic island was Third Reich material. We can imagine that after its occupation and the extermination of its Jews and other vulnerable peoples, 
Ireland might have been permitted nominal independence and a docile pro-German dictator. So what about the fate of the United States? Hitler had no plans for invading the USA. He underestimated America's fighting capability, refusing to believe that a nation of mongrels could defeat his Aryan Empire. The logistics, too, would have been even more daunting. With the Wehrmacht already stretched thin across Europe and Africa, occupying another large continent would have been impossible. Canada, a British subject, might have fared worse, with Hitler as its head of state instead of King George VI. This means, however, that the United States could potentially keep fighting. Another atom bomb might have ended up being dropped on Berlin or another European city, decimating them like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1941, the U.S. Air Force began work on a Convair B-36 bomber, which could reach Berlin from a Canadian airbase without refueling. The B-36 would not be ready for mass production until 1948, the year America's atom bomb arsenal reached 50 warheads. That's 50 cities worth of carnage, enough perhaps to bring the worldwide Third Reich to its knees. It's not guaranteed that Japan would win its war against the Allies if Germany won its own, but a German victory would mean the subjugation of the British Empire, including Australia, as well as the Soviet Union and possibly the United States. But our greatest days, they lie ahead. Sigaya. With its enemies out of commission, Japan's brutal expansion would theoretically meet almost no opposition. Japan would be the master of the Pacific, from the western shores of North America to the border of India. It would have been the biggest sovereign power in the world. Once Hitler had seized the oil and rich farmland west of the Urals, he planned to hand the rest of the defunct Soviet Union to Japan. The empire of the rising sun would certainly have swallowed more of mainland China. They would have also taken the American territories in the Pacific, like Hawaii and Guam, all of Southeast Asia, and possibly Alaska. Japan had already taken British colonies like Singapore, many of which are major economic forces today. If Japan had enforced its insulated economic policies on these islands, the 21st century economic landscape would be completely different. Without Asian trade and manufacturing, there would be no globalization. Germany, too, had Pacific colonies directly in the Japanese Empire's path. It's unclear whether Hitler would have had to concede Germany's former Pacific colonies to his Asian allies or if he would fight to reclaim them. Germany lost its colonies, including all outside the borders of Europe, in the Treaty of Versailles, which effectively ended World War I. These included the aforementioned islands in the Pacific, but more importantly, a significant number of African territories as well. These included regions like Cameroon and Togo in the west of Africa, Tanganyika, now known as Tanzania, and Burundi in the east of Africa, and Namibia in Africa's southwest. Hitler was determined to restore German control of these countries. He also planned to seize the colonies of his defeated European rivals, most notably France and Britain. Most of Africa, besides the Italian, Vichy French, and the Spanish enclaves, would likely be speaking German and flying a swastika banner. The Nazis enjoyed a fair amount of support among some of South Africa's Afrikaner population, which had historically opposed British rule and was quite experienced in creating and dominating a racial underclass. Some South Africans even formed pro-Nazi militias in anticipation of their unification with the Third Reich. It's not hard to imagine an African managerial caste reporting to Berlin and manned by Afrikaners, enforced by some version of apartheid from the Sahara to Madagascar. Benito Mussolini was one of the most notorious dictators of the 20th century, but how did his empire come crashing down? What happened in his gruesome final moments? And how did he wind up in a monastery after his death? Keep watching to find out. Mussolini was an Italian political leader turned fascist dictator who ruled the country from 1925 until 1945. He was one of Hitler's most important allies in World War II and a vicious despot to boot. Mussolini's National Fascist Party rounded up socialists, restricted the press, and imprisoned suspected anti-fascists without trial. He started his own fascist youth group similar to the Hitler Youth and called for the expulsion of Jews from Italy in an attempt to align with his German counterpart. This policy led to the death of 8,950 Italian Jews in Nazi concentration camps between 1943 and 1945. Mussolini was able to dominate Italy using an organized group of ex-soldiers known as the Black Shirts. Founded in 1919, the Black Shirts used violence to instill fear and keep Italians in check. At the same time, Mussolini's regime turned out endless propaganda and took steps to enshrine his permanent rule as Il Duce into law. This all came crashing down, however, after the breakout of World War II. As the war turned against the Axis forces, Mussolini became worried about being handed over for his crimes. He had a stroke of luck, however, when the German military took over control of northern Italy in 1943. Mussolini subsequently ran Hitler's puppet government in the region until the Allied forces finally triumphed in 1945. 
Discovering that the Nazis intended to surrender him to the Allies, Mussolini attempted to flee the country and make for the Swiss border. He did this by pretending to be a German soldier driving in a convoy. But he and his mistress, Claretta Patacci, were quickly caught. They were given a trial by a group of partisan soldiers and condemned to death. Mussolini reportedly told his captors, Let me save my life and I will give you an empire. But his pleas went unheard. On April 28, 1945, Mussolini and Patacci were shot and killed by a firing squad. His last words were reportedly, No, no. One witness observed, Mussolini died badly. No one is officially sure who killed Mussolini and Patacci, but it's generally assumed that it was the work of Italian communists. Mussolini's story didn't end with his death, though. His body and that of Patacci, along with the corpses of several other executed fascists, were dumped on the cobblestones of the Piazzale Loreto in Milan. A public announcement was made about the bodies, and a crowd quickly gathered. One man kicked the jaw of Mussolini's corpse. Another woman fired five shots into the corpse's skull, one for each of her dead sons. The body was beaten, urinated on, spit on, whipped, and had flaming objects thrown at it. Finally, the bodies of Mussolini, Patacci, and four others were strung up by the ankles to the crowd's delight. Piazzale Loreto was a significant place for this to occur. Less than a year earlier, in August 1944, several members of Italy's resistance had been shot and killed there by the Nazis. A 1945 article from the New York Times expressed that Mussolini deserved nothing less. His body was then taken to the morgue by American soldiers. An autopsy found that Mussolini had been shot by seven to nine bullets, some of which were around his heart, which ultimately caused his death. His body was subsequently buried in an unmarked grave in Milan that was, by all accounts, easy to find and easy to access. It was continually vandalized until fascists eventually dug up his corpse. Mussolini's body was later discovered in August 1946 at a monastery near Milan. There, it was laid to rest for some time. But that's still not the end of the story. After 11 years at the monastery, the body was returned to his widow, Raquele Mussolini. She then buried it at a family crypt in Mussolini's hometown of Predapio, Italy. On December 13, 2003, United States forces successfully executed Operation Red Dawn and captured Saddam Hussein. Eight months after overthrowing Hussein, the U.S. government had placed him at the top of the most wanted Iraqis list. And for eight months, Hussein was able to evade his pursuers. But his luck ran out that morning as he was found on a farm outside the Iraqi city of Tikrit. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Dragged from a hole in the ground, the disheveled former president of Iraq was arrested and charged with crimes against humanity. Following a trial conducted by the Iraqi Special Tribunal, Hussein was found guilty on November 5, 2006 and sentenced to hang. After Hussein lost a last-minute appeal to the Iraqi Supreme Court, his death sentence was carried out on December 30. Hussein's road to leadership was paved with the blood of his political enemies. At the age of 22, Hussein was part of an assassination plot to execute Iraqi General Abdel Karim Qasem. The plan was botched, however, and Qasem was only wounded in the attack. After fleeing Iraq to Egypt, Hussein and his fellow Ba'athist party members regrouped with better organization. He returned to Baghdad in 1963 to participate in a coup that toppled Qasem's government, resulting in Qasem's murder. 1968 proved to be an important year in Hussein's power trajectory. His first cousin, Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr, became the first Ba'athist president of Iraq. Hussein was appointed to be the head of internal security, a role that allowed him to stay close to his cousin. By the time al-Bakr's health began to fail in 1979, Hussein was serving as the country's vice president. As fate would have it, al-Bakr took a turn for the worse and could no longer serve the Iraqi people. Upon resigning, the role of presidency was turned over to Saddam Hussein. The Iraqi people had thrived under the leadership of al-Bakr. During his tenure, the government financed subsidies on basic commodities, reduced taxes, and implemented public welfare programs. The growing oil industry helped his endeavors, leading many Iraqi citizens to a better quality of life than they had ever experienced. What Saddam would bring to the table almost immediately sent the country into a tailspin. After taking over the presidency, Hussein had his political opponents arrested and tried for treason. Many of them were executed after being found guilty in sham trials. Concerned about the rising Shiite movement in Iran, Hussein launched a full-scale war against his neighbor. Unfortunately, much of the world supported Hussein in this effort, resulting in his army gaining access to international funds, sophisticated weaponry, and chemical weapons. While this eight-year war destroyed the Iraq economy that had blossomed under his predecessor, Hussein was committing atrocities against people inside his own country's border. Paranoid about any of his subjects being loyal to Iran, Hussein began to purge his country of suspected traitors. In 1980, Hussein began the persecution of thousands of Faili Kurds, whom he considered Iranian. In 1983, Hussein called for the capture of those associated with the Kurdistan Democratic Party. Over 5,000 males disappeared, some as young as 10 years old. 
Decades later, hundreds of their bodies were found buried in a mass grave. In 1988, Hussein launched chemical weapon attacks against Kurdish villages, killing an estimated 50,000 to 100,000 people. During that same year, Hussein gassed the village of Halabja, killing more than 5,000 innocent people in a single day. For these and other crimes, Hussein was at last executed. But what became of his body? Immediately after his execution, Hussein's body was placed under the control of the United States. In early 2007, Hussein was interred inside an opulent mausoleum at his home village of Alja. Out of growing fears of vandalism and corp desecration and an abundance of caution, officials and family members began considering moving the body elsewhere. Finally, in 2014, Hussein was disinterred. The exact whereabouts of his burial are unknown and will likely stay that way for years to come. As it turns out, moving Hussein's body was the correct move. Not long after the transfer, his family's tomb was almost completely destroyed by a battle in Alja. The once majestic resting place of one of the 20th century's most brutal dictators remains level. Rat catcher, judo master, scheming world leader all can describe Russian President Vladimir Putin. So how did a relatively unknown former KGB officer become the leader of Russia? The real story of Putin's rise may surprise you. If baby Vladimir Putin's crib had been a rusty bear trap, it would seem perfectly in line with the rest of his harsh upbringing. In his book First Person, Putin revealed that his father was a physically disabled factory worker who suffered a serious leg injury during World War II. Putin's mother swept streets, cleaned lab equipment, and did other odd jobs for meager pay. Putin and his parents lived in a tiny room as part of a shared apartment. They had no bathtub or hot water, and their toilet sat next to a dangerously dilapidated stairwell that was riddled with holes. To pass the time, Putin and his pals harassed the rats that plagued his apartment stairwell. It was during one of those rodent hunts that the future president learned a valuable lesson about the dangers of backing opponents into a corner. Putin wrote in first person, Once I spotted a huge rat and pursued it down the hall until I drove it into a corner. It had nowhere to run. Suddenly, it lashed around and threw itself at me. I was surprised and frightened. Now the rat was chasing me. Putin got away, but the memory never escaped him. Vladimir Putin's home life was no picnic, but he more than compensated by devouring classroom time with disruptive outbursts. His official Kremlin biography depicts the early portion of his education as a period of chronic tardiness and infrequent studying. He seldom dressed properly and seemed to wear rebellion like a badge of honor. The young Putin ignored lessons, chucked chalk erasers at fellow students, and fought his gym teacher on multiple occasions. The unruly Putin's grades were middling for the most part. However, he excelled at history and German. German, in particular, had a stranglehold on Putin's heart. He even kept German flashcards in his chemistry textbook. Every good teacher knows there's a big difference between performance and potential, which certainly proved true in Putin's case. Behind his veneer of audacity was the beating brain of a grade A student. In sixth grade, a teacher helped him tap into his inner scholar and his marks improved significantly. Putin's high school years were a complete 180 from his puckish primary school days. After getting accepted to a school for the gifted, he established himself as an outstanding student. From there, he went to law school and soon after joined the KGB. Most youngsters have big dreams for their adult careers that get whittled down by reality. But Vladimir Putin pretty much brought his fantasy to fruition. From the ninth grade on, Putin knew that he wanted to join the KGB. Driven by his naive boyhood yearning, he traveled to the KGB headquarters in Leningrad to offer his services. However, officials told him to go to law school instead. He listened, earning a law degree in 1975. Evidently impressed with his follow-through, the intelligence agency offered Putin a post, which he gladly accepted. He soon went to spy school where he honed his German skills and judo chopped his way to a black belt. In 1985, Putin traveled to East Germany to do intelligence work. The details of his exact activities are murky at best, but The Atlantic suggested he may have collected technological secrets or enlisted high-ranking government officials as part of a mission called Operation Luch. In 2017, Putin made a stunning revelation after claiming to have worked with illegal intelligence. In other words, his activities somehow involved deep cover espionage without the cover of diplomatic protections. East Germany provided a drastic departure from the brutal austerity of Soviet Russia. It had cleaner streets, good beer, and greater political freedom. Since he was now living in East Germany, Putin could pursue far finer things than stairwell rats. 
including trendy clothes and a car. The spy life wasn't too glamorous, but it didn't need to be when he could just knock back a cold one with a comrade or flip through a fashion catalog. However, there always comes a time when fantasies fade. Putin's rude awakening came in November 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The wall that the East Germans put up in 1961 to keep its people in will now be breached by anybody one who wants to leave. Citizens had already been pouring into West Germany, but once freedom seemed assured, many began turning their attention and aggression toward the Soviet officials who had long stifled their freedom. Fearing violent upheaval, Putin desperately sought support from Moscow officials, but instead of getting the tanks he requested, Putin received a harrowing reply. We cannot do anything without orders from Moscow, and Moscow is silent. The words were deafening. Communism had been cornered, but instead of ferociously defending itself, it surrendered without a single squeak. Soviet influence is collapsing before his eyes, and he calls home, he radios home, and home isn't there. The Atlantic succinctly summarized how this influenced the disillusioned spy. Putin learned that his future activity in the KGB or otherwise could not be guided by blind loyalty to an ideology or to specific political leaders. His loyalty had to be to the state itself. After crashing to earth from his communist cloud, Vladimir Putin wanted to create a system grounded in nationalistic fervor and subservience to ruling institutions. During his first stint as Russian prime minister, he fleshed out that vision in a 1999 document titled Russia at the Turn of the Millennium. Commonly referred to as the Millennium Manifesto, the document presented Putin's reading of Russia's past and future prospects. In the document, the then Prime Minister primarily attributed Russia's history of political upheaval to a divided populace. Denizens had grown overly enamored with foreign concepts like free speech and individuality. For Russia to take its place in the pantheon of great nations, citizens needed to unite under a muscular central government. Rather fittingly, two days after unveiling his manifesto on Russian destiny, Putin became president. Ten years separated the fall of the Berlin Wall and Vladimir Putin's ascent to the Russian presidency. During much of that intervening period, Putin was a relative unknown, and once he became known, he aroused little confidence among political experts. Even when Boris Yeltsin promoted Putin to prime minister in 1999, analysts largely agreed that the upstart would have limitations as far as what he could accomplish. Putin's track record up to that point was fairly barren. After serving briefly as deputy mayor of Leningrad, Putin worked under President Boris Yeltsin between 1998 and 1999. He started as a liaison between the Kremlin and lower government offices, became head of security for a while, and soon got tapped to be prime minister. Five months later, Yeltsin stepped down and named Putin president. In less than two years, Putin had gone from being a political question mark to a giant red exclamation point. However, as the Washington Post reported, the young president won public approval by waging an aggressive war against Chechen rebels and touting himself as a tough guy. When the time came to officially elect a new Russian president, Putin won decisively. Future starts here and now. Future is you. RT hilariously refers to Vladimir Putin as a, quote, judo knight, and features him swiveling his hips and tossing docile opponents about like dolls. Judo is so essential to Putin's identity that he politically aligns himself with billionaire judo enthusiasts. Some have even referred to his inner circle as a judocracy. According to Newsweek, this Putin views judo as a philosophy that teaches self-control, the ability to feel the moment, to see the opponent's strengths and weaknesses, to strive for the best results. That ethos has come to define his political decision-making and approach to geopolitical conflict. According to Russian Deputy Finance Minister Sergei Alexashenko, Russia's 2014 Crimea takeover perfectly illustrates the president's judo state of mind. According to the Deputy Finance Minister, rather than engaging in a bloody battle, Putin curried favor with ethnic Russians in the Ukrainian military, largely eliminating the need for fighting. Viewed in light of Alexashenko's assessment, it seems fair to say that the judo knight turned his opponent's main line of defense into a defect. In a similar vein, political wonk Nikolai Petrov has argued that Putin uses economic sanctions on Russian businessmen to consolidate power. It seems that in a world where geopolitics often gets likened to chess, 
Putin trips up adversaries by playing a different game altogether. In many ways, Vladimir Putin is a historical hybrid, a Soviet-era holdover adapted to modern times. That becomes abundantly clear when one examines the way he wields information as both a shield and a weapon. As Wired explained, unfettered information makes Putin uncomfortable, given his KGB training. For years, knowledge was what you stole or withheld from others, not something you nakedly shared with the world. Moreover, the collapse of the Soviet Union coincided with increased internet access and intellectual independence. In Putin's mind, it was a sign that society had veered off course and needed correcting. As president, he resolved to return Russia to a kind of pre-knowledge state. Initially, Putin limited his focus to controlling television and newspapers, unaware of the internet's true transformative potential. Then, 2011 happened. That year, oppressed Arab citizens lashed out against their governments in response to damning documents released by WikiLeaks. Social media sites like Facebook and Twitter helped fuel the uprisings. Tunisia's government toppled. I know this is the first Arab revolution of the 21st century, or it will be brutally suppressed. In Russia, accusations of electoral chicanery spurred voter unrest. But unlike Moscow in 1989, Putin refused to stay silent. It was time to drop the hammer, and also the sickle if need be. In 2012, the Kremlin began quashing unwanted websites and sent internet trolls after bloggers and journalists who criticized the regime. Naturally, hacking became a technological trump card. Despite ruling Russia for the better part of 20 years, Vladimir Putin has remained unreadable as ever to presidents and pundits alike. It's almost as if a former Soviet spy with a law degree and a strong dislike of political transparency has been running the show all this time. And what a show it's been. New York Times contributor and longtime Russia correspondent Stephen Myers spent years observing the workings of the Kremlin and offered a few insights on what makes Putin so impenetrable. Unsurprisingly, Putin keeps the media on a tight leash and himself on an even tighter one. During interviews, he answers controversial questions with cautiously worded equivocations, always sure not to paint himself into a corner. Aside from heavily scripted press conferences and choreographed public engagements, most of what he does goes unreported. Meanwhile, the slightest hint of criticism from any public figure gets swiftly snuffed out. Putin also puts up a technological wall, though not necessarily in the way that you think. In a 2014 Time article, Simon Schuster argued that the ex-spy's aversion to using modern technology has made him incredibly difficult to tap. He doesn't use a cell phone. He owns a computer but avoids using the internet. Additionally, Putin gets his news delivered directly by intelligence officials via folders and paper documents. It goes without saying that the president of Russia is extremely tech-averse. Vladimir Putin's life has spanned an absurd number of historic events. He was born five months before Joseph Stalin's death. He witnessed communism's collapse firsthand and inherited his first presidency from the Soviet Union's last leader. Furthermore, Putin literally reshaped another country by taking one of its territories. Given his seemingly forever long reign, many have wondered when will Putin retire from politics. In 2014, Russian reporters asked the president point-blank whether he intended to change the constitution to make his reign permanent. Putin responded that changing the constitution would be, quote, detrimental for the country. He also added that he had no intentions of doing it. The Independent noted that Russia's constitution prohibits presidents from having more than two consecutive terms. Putin became a three-term president by simply taking a break in between to become prime minister a second time. However, in 2021, he signed a law that would allow him to potentially serve until 2036. The new legislation essentially zeroes out his previous terms. Currently, nobody knows his intentions because, as Putin put it, he has yet to decide if he'll leave the presidency. After all, the truly powerful don't have to cling to their power. They simply have it. Lawyer, ex-KGB, judo master, animal lover? Russian President Vladimir Putin is all of those things, but he's also extremely secretive. So who is the real Vladimir Putin? Keep watching to find out. Born in St. Petersburg in the early 1950s, young Vladimir Putin and his family had a living situation that was entirely common for Soviet citizens of the time. The Putins shared a single apartment with two other families. 
This meant communal use of the stove, the sink, the restroom, and so forth among all three of the families. Yet the Putin family was actually well set up in the context of the place and time, having the largest room to themselves. It was a 12 foot by 15 foot room the young Vladimir shared with his mother and father. The Putins were also notable in that they had a television set and telephone in their apartment, as well as a small dacha, or vacation home outside of the city to which they could retreat when time permitted. For the times, it was an entirely comfortable upbringing, one that would even have been the envy of many nearly destitute Soviet citizens of the day. Despite the aura of invincibility the adult Putin likes to create around himself, his life has hardly been one long success story. As a young man, Putin was a poor student. He was often tardy and occasionally truant, and did not devote much time or effort to his studies. Furthermore, Putin was often in trouble for things like talking in class, passing notes, and even hurling chalkboard erasers at other students when possessed by fits of anger. His grades were modest at best, and overall he showed little promise during his grade school years. Mediocre performance in grade school and middle school notwithstanding, Putin earned a spot in the respected high school Leningrad School No. 281. In his high school years, Putin turned things around. The future Russian president began studying hard and earned much better marks as a result. And at that point, Putin continued to focus on the one area in which he had always shined, athletics, and in particular martial arts. Putin had begun to practice Sambo and Judo at around age 11, and he showed an immediate aptitude for martial arts, which remain an important part of his life even today. Not that Russian President Vladimir Putin displays much concern for following laws these days, but it's still worth noting that Putin earned a law degree back in the 70s. To be specific, he graduated with his degree in law from Leningrad State University in 1975, though the future intelligence officer, president, and prime minister of Russia would never actually practice law. Fifteen years after graduating, he did, for a brief stint, work at the same school from which he had graduated following the end of a long KGB assignment. Not that Putin was the least bit upset about never being a practicing lawyer. Frankly, he never even wanted to use the degree as anything more than a stepping stone toward his ultimate goal in life as a young man. He wanted to be a spy. The young Vladimir Putin became enamored with the KGB after reading about the agency's clandestine work and, at the tender age of 15, even showed up to a local KGB outpost to volunteer to join the service. When an officer there explained to young Putin that the KGB never took on volunteers, always recruiting its members, Putin asked what he could do to increase his chances of being hired. The man replied that one should first attend law school in order to be considered for the KGB. Upon hearing this, Putin studied hard and went on to earn a law degree and soon after graduating, he was indeed invited to join the secret police. Vladimir Putin served as a KGB officer for about 15 years. Thus, his time as a spy was by far the most substantial portion of his career before he entered politics in the 1990s. He joined the KGB shortly after graduating from Leningrad State University in 1975, and he would remain a KGB operative until his 1990 retirement from the service. By the time he had separated from the secretive organization, he had earned the rank of lieutenant colonel. In the early days of his career as a spy, Putin was stationed in his home city of Leningrad and tasked with monitoring the activities of both foreign nationals in the city as well as Russian officials working at consulates in Leningrad. After nearly a decade spent in this relatively low-level type of assignment, Putin was briefly transferred to Moscow for additional KGB training before being sent to the eastern German city of Dresden, then a part of the USSR. It was in Dresden that Putin would serve in a still classified capacity for the next handful of years. As East Germany slipped out of Soviet control in 1989, the year the infamous Berlin Wall fell, Putin returned to Russia, settling in Moscow. The Iron Curtain between East Germany and West Berlin has come tumbling down. The KGB would be dissolved after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, thus allowing Putin to begin his new life in politics. In August of 1999, President Boris Yeltsin, who clearly saw huge potential in Vladimir Putin, appointed the 47-year-old as Prime Minister of Russia. It's entirely possible Yeltsin did so primarily to clear the way for his quasi-protege to move up to an even higher office, because when Yeltsin stepped down from the presidency four months later, in December 1999, he appointed Putin as the acting president of Russia. Putin would be elected to the office in his own right in March 2000. Putin was officially sworn in for his first presidential term in early May of 2000 and held the office until May of 2008. Then, Putin was appointed as the Prime Minister of Russia by his handpicked successor to the presidency, Dmitry Medvedev. After waiting while Medvedev served his single term as president, Putin ran and, of course, won office again, resuming his role atop Russia's political hierarchy in 2012. We have won. Long live Russia! With term limits for Russian presidents having been extended to six years, he held office until 2018 and was then handily re-elected. During this fourth term as president, Putin saw to it that laws were changed that will let him run twice more, so Putin may well serve until 2036 if he remains healthy and interested in staying in power. Future starts here and now. 
future is you. Vladimir Putin has more money than he could easily spend in a lifetime, especially given the fact that he's nearing 70 years of age. According to Forbes, Putin is almost assuredly a billionaire, and potentially many times over. However, no one can get a handle on exactly how much money the Russian president is worth, nor can we be exactly sure how he amassed his shadowy wealth either. But there are a handful of prevailing theories that might explain how Putin has become so prosperous. The first major infusion of cash the ostensibly public servant may have gained could have come from his misappropriating the wealth seized from oligarch Mikhail Khodorkovsky, whom Putin and his government had jailed on trumped-up charges in 2003. Much of the cash that was taken from the billionaire was never accounted for, after all. Another theory behind Putin's wealth is even more directly illicit. He might simply be paid by people whom he allows to break the law, or at least skirt it. Putin may well have made millions or even tens of millions through bribes, kickbacks, and thank you payments for helping his cronies to better themselves as long as they better his bank account. Surely, time has come to change this. There is one other theory, and it's that Putin is rich in bravado and swagger, but not in cash. He might not have billions or even many millions himself, despite his projection of wealth. But it really would not matter, as he has the state coffers of Russia at his disposal to fund almost any whim. Vladimir Putin was married for a very long time, but has now been divorced for many years. Putin married his now ex-wife on July 8, 1983, after the couple had courted for a couple of years. Born in early 1958, Ludmila Shkrebnivya was a little more than half a decade Putin's junior and was in her early 20s when they met. She was a stewardess, which was a coveted and competitive job in the USSR in that era. Putin would later say of his marriage to Ludmila, I understood that if I didn't marry for another two or three years, I would never marry. Though, of course, I had made a habit of leading a bachelor's life. Ludmilla uprooted it. So, perhaps unsurprisingly, Putin was not exactly a hopeless romantic. It's surprising that the Putins managed to stay married for so many years, all things considered. The couple remained married for 30 years, only divorcing in the year 2013. By the end of the union, there was apparently no love left and plenty of acrimony. With Ludmilla calling her husband a, quote, vampire, with Putin saying at one point that those who could stand to be around his soon-to-be ex-wife for more than three weeks deserved to have a monument erected in their honor. Vladimir Putin definitely has at least two children, and there's a chance he has more. The Russian president is a master at keeping his personal life secret, despite how often the eyes of the world are on him, so it's quite hard to know for sure. But the two known children were born long before he had ascended to top national office, and we do know a few things about them. Both children are daughters, and both were born with Putin's ex-wife Ludmilla. One of his now adult children is believed to be 36 years old, the other 35, meaning that they would have been born when Putin was still posted in Dresden in East Germany. Vladimir Putin's older daughter, Maria Varonsova, is a genetics researcher and endocrinologist who lived for some years in the Netherlands, until officials in that country called for her to be expelled, following the suspected Russian-backed downing of a passenger plane in the year 2014. His younger daughter, Katerina Tikhanova, is a scientist who studies physics and mathematics and is a member of the Russian Council for the Development of Physical Culture and Mass Sports. She is also a former competitive acrobatic dancer. While Vladimir Putin's marriage may have flamed out with no love left at the end of 30 long years, he still has lots of love to give, it seems. And some of that love overlapped, too. Putin has purportedly been involved with former gymnast Alina Kabayeva since the early 2000s. Though, as per standard operating procedure with the Russian president's personal life, the details here are all quite murky. We know for sure that Putin and Kabayeva have been an item in the past and likely still are. And we know that Kabayeva is a good three decades younger than Putin. The former gymnast may be the mother to more Putin children, and she may also be but one of several girlfriends the autocratic ruler has now or has had over the years of the past decade or two. Some sources have hinted that Kabayeva gave birth to twins by Putin, in fact. What is known for sure about Alina Kabayeva herself is that she was an inarguably talented and accomplished gymnast in her heyday, having earned two Olympic medals, a gold and a bronze. After leaving sports, Kabayeva tried out modeling, singing, and a few other false start careers. She then entered politics and held a seat in the Duma section of Russia's parliament for nearly a decade. Putin is definitely known for bragging about many things, but when it comes to martial arts, he puts his money where his mouth is. Putin is a black belt in judo, or at least he was, until the International Federation of Judo stripped him of his title in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Lack of title aside, the Russian president has long been recognized as a competent practitioner of judo and sambo, and he has trained in the martial arts since he was a boy. The practice has always been close to Putin's heart. So much so that well into his national political career, he even found time to serve as the head of the same studio where he had trained as a child. It's worth noting that when a noted U.S. Marine judo expert analyzed Putin's performance in judo exhibitions, he confirmed the leader as genuinely capable even well into his 60s. 
Vladimir Putin is fluent in three languages. Of course, the native Russian speaks his mother tongue, and he's also quite fluent in German, a language he was compelled to use often during his years in the KGB when he was posted in East Germany. Putin is also known to be able to speak English, but what's not clear is the Russian president's level of fluency in this language. He is reportedly a good enough English speaker to be able to understand the language well enough to not need translators, but he hardly ever reveals this in public. According to Express, it is almost assuredly a careful political calculation that has led to Putin's reticence to speak English in public. After all, geopolitically, most of the nations in which English is the primary language are at odds with Russia and were even outright enemies of the Soviet Union he served during the early years of his career. In other words, it's a power play, as Express puts it. He is admitted to knowing the language, though, and does use it privately, such as when he spoke directly to director Oliver Stone on several occasions while the American filmmaker interviewed him in 2017. Do you like it? Very much. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Putin does, for the record, often speak in German in public. Before the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin has a long history of ordering assassinations, or at least doing so tacitly, though no one paying much attention has any doubts who is directing things. Of the many deaths that have resulted from Putin's directives are those of journalist Anna Polovkaskia, who was shot to death in the fall of 2006 following her revealing reporting of the ongoing Russian aggression in Chechnya. Putin also surely okayed the poisoning death of former intelligence officer turned defector Alexander Litvinenko in London in that same year. There are a host of other successful assassinations that can be tied to Putin, along with several failed attempts, such as the failed poisoning of former intelligence officer Sergei Skripal and of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. For those who have lived through an attempted Russian assassination, it's likely just a matter of time before another attempt is made, which makes Navalny's continued vocal opposition to Putin all the more impressive. In what has only become a more and more laughably bitter irony with the unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin was once nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, the same prize that has been issued to the likes of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, and the Dalai Lama, just to name a few. How did Putin find himself even adjacent to the many recipients of this August prize? It was made by the Russian International Academy of Spiritual Unity and Cooperation of Peoples of the World, an advocacy group that reportedly pursues peace around the world. Putin was nominated by the organization thanks to his help in finding a non-military way to punish the Syrian government for using illegal chemical weapons in the course of the protracted Syrian civil war. This is, of course, the same Vladimir Putin who worked closely with the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad on matters such as securing a 50-year lease for Russian extraction of phosphate in regions of Syria. You can say a lot of negative things about Vladimir Putin and have them be true, and you can say a lot of positive things about him and have them be false, but one truth about this complex man is that he loves animals. Now, that's not to say he does not kill animals at times, whether he is hunting big game with a high-powered rifle or fishing while conspicuously shirtless. But nonetheless, he has a soft spot for furry friends. For instance, there was the time that Putin leapt to his feet and snatched a dog held hanging from its scruff by Turkmenistan's president. Putin then cradled and calmed the puppy, protecting it with a notable tenderness. Additionally, there have been many times that Putin has been photographed cuddling with big cats, such as leopards and tigers met at animal sanctuaries. It's quite likely that President Vladimir Putin is a very rich man, and it's quite unlikely anyone will ever know the true extent of his wealth. But if you want to get an idea of his likely riches, look not to a dollar amount alone, but also to other less liquid assets, like those on wheels, for example. According to the India Times, Putin may own as many as 700 cars. While well, the most visible car associated with Putin is his official state car, an RS Senate limousine, it is hardly his only vehicle. Putin owns a broad array of cars of all types, and he apparently also may have as many as 58 aircraft. Putin also, of course, has a mega yacht that is worth around $100 million. For a bit of perspective here, according to TASS, the median monthly salary in Russia was 32,422 rubles, or about $450 per month in 2020. That amounts to a median annual income of about $5,400 in US dollars, which is not enough to buy a plane or yacht or even a limousine. Disavowed, disrespected, and occasionally even dismembered, not a lot of good seems to come to women who associate too closely with dictators. In 1989, as the Iron Curtain started to fall across Eastern Europe, the reign of Romania's dictator Nicolae Ceausescu came to a sudden and dramatic end. The inflection point occurred during a speech that didn't get the normal cheers from the subjugated crowd, but booing instead. Years later, one witness told The Independent, I was there when the people turned. It was exhilarating because this man had ruled every aspect of our lives since before we could remember, and none of it had been good, whatever lies he had spun. By Christmas Day, a show trial resulted in a death sentence for both Nikolai and his wife Elena. The execution took place immediately. 
There are conflicting recollections about how Elena reacted to her imminent death, alternating from pleading to cursing those involved. One of the men in the firing squad, Yonel Boreru, told the British tabloid The Mirror, she yelled at a soldier, you mother -er. Other sources reported that she said, why, why, I raised you like a mother. She said to be careful with her friends because uh, it could be broken. It doesn't matter if they're broken or not when you are going to die in five minutes. Other contemporary reports recorded that she tried to flee or openly wept. Boeru told The Guardian that the pair were executed together as a kindness since they were in love, saying, I shot them very fast. I feel I helped them to die with dignity. Future Chinese dictator Mao Zedong had an arranged marriage as a teenager with a girl named Luo Yishu. The marriage was not a success, and Luo died less than two years later from illness. Later in life, Mao refused to even recognize the existence of the marriage. Mao chose his second wife, Yang Kai Hui, in 1920. In the private life of Chairman Mao, Mao's personal doctor, Li Ji Sui, concludes that the dictator did not register the suffering of other humans. That might be the reason he callously rejected Yang as well, although her death was very different from that of the woman who preceded her. Yang left writings showing she was aware that Mao was cheating on her. While she eventually lost faith in his politics, she still loved him, according to Mao, the unknown story. Mao, however, did not seem to return that affection. He was off fighting when he met another revolutionary, Han Zhejian. The couple married in 1928 without waiting for Mao to legally divorce Yang. Despite this rejection and abandonment, Yang stood by her husband to the very end. In 1930, she was captured by the Kuomintang, the nationalist Chinese government her communist husband was trying to overthrow. She chose death over betraying Mao to his enemies and was executed after being tortured. Mao Zedong's final marriage was to actress Zhang Qing, who would go on to become almost as infamous as her husband. He married her in 1939 after divorcing his third wife. When Zhang started throwing her political muscle around in the 1960s, she proved to be ruthless, helping mastermind the Cultural Revolution. Good evening. Mao Zedong, the most powerful influence on China since Confucius, has died at the age of 82. Mao died in 1976, and within a year, Zhang had also fallen. In 1980, she was put on trial for crimes committed during the Cultural Revolution and soon sentenced to death. Her defense, as quoted in the Washington Post, was that she did what Mao ordered her to do, or as she famously put it, I was Chairman Mao's dog. Whomever he told me to bite, I bit. The execution was delayed for two years, and in 1983, her sentence had been commuted to life in prison as she had reformed. Only four years later, Zhang was diagnosed with throat cancer. Before cancer could kill her, she died by suicide in 1991. China rejoiced at her death, with Shanghai's Liberation Daily stating, It goes without saying that death cannot expiate her crimes. The 1975-76 issue of Transition featured a profile of Ugandan dictator Idi Amin, but his wives got their own section, and for good reason. As the magazine poetically phrased it, the story of Amin will furnish some future Ugandan Shakespeare with more than enough material for an African Henry VIII. Idi Amin married numerous times and practiced polygamy. Keodroa wed the already married Idi in 1966, five years before he took power in Uganda. But by 1973, Idi's relationship with Kay had deteriorated completely. After he had a politician who had fallen from favor killed, Kay left him. In retaliation, Edie announced he was divorcing her as well as two other wives. In August 1974, UPI reported that Kay Amin's dismembered body had been discovered in the trunk of her doctor's car. The same doctor had died, allegedly by suicide, the day before her body was found. The official story was that she died after a botched abortion. The doctor tried to hide the body and then killed himself when he failed to do so, although there is little evidence of what actually happened. In the early 1900s, Joseph Stalin was already involved in revolutionary politics. At one point, he used a safe house owned by the Swanidza family in present-day Tbilisi, Georgia, according to Stalin, Paradoxes of Power. One of the family's three daughters caught Stalin's eye, and while he spent much of his time at the house working on political projects, he also got Kato Swanidza pregnant. In 1906, the pair decided to get married. While friends remembered Stalin as being very much in love with his wife, he also immediately abandoned her for the cause. During her pregnancy, Swanitsa spent six weeks in jail for the crime of marrying Stalin. When she gave birth, he was away. Finally, when facing charges of robbery in Tbilisi, Stalin moved his wife and son far from her family. Their new home, Baku, was not a good environment for Swanitsa, and she only stayed about five months before returning to her family. Once she was back home, she became deathly ill. While her exact cause of death isn't certain, it wasn't painless, since it was recorded that she was hemorrhaging blood from her bowels. While Stalin was distraught at her death, he took off again abandoning his son for over a decade. After the death of Stalin's first wife in 1907, the dictator didn't marry again until 1918, a year after the Russian Revolution. So when Nadezhda Alloway wed the man 23 years her senior, she knew who he was, or at least what he might become. 
Stalin alternated between raging at her and ignoring her. By 1932, witnesses said she was completely beaten down by her husband and crushed by his extramarital affairs. After a fight, she said a final goodbye to her young children, then told the servants she wasn't to be disturbed. She was found dead the next morning, reportedly by suicide. For decades, her cause of death was covered up by the USSR, attributed to either appendicitis or heart problems. The silence was broken in 1988 when Russian playwright Mikhail Shatrov was asked about Stalin. Shatrov stated, His relations toward women? I know little about this question. We know about the suicide of his wife. In any case, Stalin was always crude. This casual reply was the first known time someone in the communist country publicly admitted how Stalin's second wife died. Korea shares brilliant race all around because it is led by Kim Jong-il, successor to President Kim Il-sung. When it comes to the ruling family of North Korea, being extraordinary isn't good enough. On the 100th birthday of Kim Jong-suk, wife of North Korea's first president Kim Il-sung, politician Yang Hong-suk gave a speech touting her greatness, saying, Human history recorded a large number of famous women revolutionaries, but has not known such a prominent woman revolutionary and genuine patriot as Kim Jong-suk. Of course, when it comes to women in a hereditary dictatorship, there's only one thing that really counts, giving birth to a son. As Yang put it, she brought up leader Kim Jong-il as the rising sun, and thus gave the people the highest honor and happiness of being blessed with the illustrious leaders generation after generation. It was another pregnancy that would end her life at just 31 years old. Some reports say that it was due to an ectopic pregnancy, while others say she died from complications delivering a stillborn baby. Official North Korean reports, on the other hand, say she died because she had put all her strength into fighting for the country. Kim Jong-suk died in 1949, one year after the founding of North Korea. Her son, future dictator Kim Jong-il, was seven. Mao Fumei was the first wife of Chiang Kai-shek, the former dictator of China and Taiwan. The arranged marriage was disastrous from the start. Mao moved into the Chiang family home and watched as the dynamics of the household destroyed what little chance her marriage ever had. She later remembered, I kept quiet and seldom spoke. The situation went from bad to worse, and Kai-shek soon became impatient with me. I dared not say one word to defend myself. All I could do was to weep secretly over my utter helplessness. The marriage had been arranged by Cheng's mother, so it was only after she died that Cheng divorced Mao. He later wrote, For the past 10 years, I have not been able to bear the sound of her footsteps or seeing her shadow. After the divorce, Mao continued to live in the Cheng family home. In 1939, during the Second Sino-Japanese War, Japan's military tried to punish Cheng by bombing his hometown. Mao was killed by a bomb as she fled at the air raid warning. Later, her son with Cheng would lay a stone at the site of her death, reading, it takes blood to wash out blood. Yugoslavian dictator Josip Broz Tito married several times and didn't remember all his marriages fondly. When it comes to Tito's relationship with his first wife, Pelagia Belosova, fellow politician Milovan Gilas later said, It seemed as if he wanted to blot out every trace of it from his life and his memory. In 1936, while still married to Belosova, he met Johanna Koenig, who also went by Lucia Bauer, and quickly divorced Belosova to marry her. The marriage was a short one. In 1938, Bauer was arrested during Stalin's purge of potential political dissidents and sentenced to death after a sham trial. Shortly after her execution, Tito made a public statement expressing his disappointment in not noticing his wife's treachery. Bauer is not usually included on lists of Tito's wives, and author Neil Barnett writes that this was a deliberate cover-up. Tito was so secretive about his life, even his birth date is up for debate. Shortly before Tito died, he declared to his personal physician, If you think you know me and know who is Tito, you are hugely wrong, doctor. You do not know who is Tito, nor will you ever know. No one met Tito, nor will meet him. Eva Braun met Adolf Hitler in 1929 when she was 17 years old, and he was more than two decades older. While many people know the name of the woman who chose to be with one of the most infamous men in history, the biography Eva Braun, Life with Hitler, says that the public perception of her probably isn't accurate. Eva Braun is always portrayed as the dumb blonde who had the misfortune to fall in love with the devil, and this is an image that needs to be corrected. She was capricious, an uncompromising advocate of unconditional loyalty towards the dictator, who went so far as to die with him, and he adored her. In the Führer bunker in Berlin towards the end of World War II, Braun was upbeat and through semi-secret parties. She was not living in reality. She tried to push away everything that was uh, disturbing her. Still only 33, she was staying with Hitler to the end, and they both knew it. And all the time they'd been together, he hadn't agreed to marry her, and in fact kept their relationship relatively secret. But as things came to a head outside, the two married in the bunker in a small and informal ceremony. Just a day and a half later, on April 30th, 1945, the now husband and wife sat alone in a room in the bunker before they both died by suicide. 
In many ways, it's astonishing that Nadezhda Krupskaya lived as long as she did. The wife of Vladimir Lenin, she was a key player in the young Soviet Union. But once Lenin died in 1924, some of her vocal opinions put her at odds with Joseph Stalin. As Toxic Politics explains, Stalin had getting rid of his enemies down to a science. It should have been simple to take out this interfering widow and revolutionary figure. Yet 15 years after her husband's death, Krupskaya was still alive and talking. In the end, her death may have been sealed by a rumor she was going to openly denounce Stalin on her 70th birthday in 1939, according to a paper in the Journal of Education for Library and Information Science. Two days before her birthday, she got together with about a dozen friends for a quiet but fancy dinner. Within hours, she passed out, and despite being quickly put under the care of multiple doctors, they all refused to treat her. Their decisions not to act were encouraged by Stalin, as Toxic Politics records. Krupskaya died the day after her birthday, while the cause of death was blamed on everything from appendicitis to food poisoning to a blocked intestine, all sources give credence to the most logical explanation. Stalin had her poison. It was the closing days of a war that claimed the lives of millions and the end of the rise of the Third Reich. How did it end? Deep underground? With another death that was more tragic to witnesses than the end of Hitler himself? By the spring of 1945, Russia's Red Army was converging on Berlin, and Adolf Hitler, with his longtime mistress Eva Braun, had retreated to the so-called Führer Bunker, an above and below ground complex near the Reich Chancellery, the center of Nazi government in the German capital. Construction on the Führer Bunker began in 1936, before war even broke out. It was finished in two stages, the last one concluded in 1944. The Führer Bunker was two connected shelters, and it was finally appointed with expensive rugs and art, among other luxuries. Soon, life in the bunker became chaotic, and addicted to opiates and living with Parkinson's disease, Hitler's health only worsened along with the prospects of winning the war. In the Führer Bunker along with Hitler was Nazi chief propagandist Joseph Goebbels and Hitler's own private secretary. That was Martin Bormann, a longtime member of Hitler's inner circle and the man who controlled access to the Führer. Hitler, Braun, and Goebbels' wife and family, who were also in hiding, would all kill themselves just hours before the fall of Berlin. With those deaths and the subsequent Allied victory, the Third Reich was no more, and the Second World War, in Europe at least, had mercifully come to a close. Thanks in part to the book Hitler's Last Day, Minute by Minute, the final hours of Hitler's life are recorded in chilling detail. Did you ever hear him mention suicide? Yes, after April 22nd, he talked about it constantly. As the story unfolded, the fate of those hidden with Hitler became clear, and one of history's darkest moments was resolved as Adolf Hitler, among mankind's most brutal and malicious dictators, came to his end. In total, Hitler would spend 105 days living underground. The last time Hitler ever saw the sunshine was on April 20th, his 56th birthday. After that point, he never emerged from the Führer bunker again. With news that Italian fascist dictator and Hitler ally Benito Mussolini was captured and killed by Allied forces, and with many of Hitler's inner circle turning on him, it was becoming clearer and clearer that the war was lost and the Third Reich was finished. Supplies and munitions were running low for the German army, and the Soviets were expected to take Berlin at any moment. Hitler had one final task to complete before he carried out his final act, though, as Sky History notes. Only a matter of days before Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun would end their lives, the couple decided to get married. The marriage ceremony was performed by Walter Wagner, an attorney, notary, and devout Nazi who had reportedly never even met Hitler before the wedding ceremony. In the civil ceremony, both pledged they were of pure Aryan blood, in keeping with Hitler's philosophy of racial superiority and of a master race. The wedding was followed by a somber reception. Once married, Hitler dictated his final will and testament. The following day, Hitler received an update on how the German army was proceeding. It would only be a matter of hours before the Red Army took control of Berlin. A teenage Hitler youth courier named Armin Lehmann, who was in the Führer bunker in those final hours but survived, described Hitler like a ghost, staring ahead lost in thought. When a mortar struck the ground above the bunker, Lehmann later recalled, Dirt and mortar trickled down on us, but he made no attempt to brush it off. He looked so much more unhealthy than 10 days earlier at his birthday reception. It looked like he was suffering from jaundice. His face was sallow. A telephone operator, Rokas Mish, described what it was like as the days wore on. Everybody was already half dead. It was very close to the end. I don't know if you can imagine what those days were like. Along with Hitler, Braun, and other members of the Nazi brass in the Führer bunker was Hitler's dog, a German shepherd named Blondie. Blondie had been given to Hitler in 1941 by his private secretary Martin Bormann, and it was said that Hitler and the dog were very close. According to some, the relationship was closer than Hitler was even with Braun. In the 2006 book The Lost Life of Eva Braun, it was said, 
he was more publicly demonstrative to his dog, hugging and kissing her. Hitler's affection for dogs played into Nazi propaganda that attempted to portray him as an animal lover. Perhaps unsurprisingly, that only went so far. According to Hitler and Braun's suicide pact, the two would die side by side. Braun would ingest cyanide, and Hitler would both ingest cyanide and shoot himself in the temple. Braun foregoed adding a gunshot to her suicide by cyanide, reportedly saying, I want to be a beautiful corpse. First, though, Blondie would also die to test the effectiveness of the cyanide capsule one day prior to Hitler and Braun's own suicide. One of only two survivors from the Fuhrer bunker later recalled the death of the dog affecting those in the underground bomb shelter more so than the death of Eva Braun. On April 30, 1945, and with Allied forces advancing, Adolf Hitler decided the time had come for himself and his wife to follow through on their plan to kill themselves, rather than face possible capture by Allied forces. Around noon on that day, Hitler told Bormann, The time has come. Fräulein Braun and I will end our lives this afternoon. After eating his final meal of spaghetti and salad, Hitler met with Goebbels, who urged the tyrant to reconsider and to escape instead. Hitler would not be moved, telling him, You know my decision. I'm not going to change it. At that point, Hitler and Braun entered their private chambers for the final time. A shot rang out through the bunker, and Hitler was later discovered, bloodied and slumped over, with Braun by his side. History says that their bodies were cremated in the Chancellery Garden for Hitler's wishes. Also keeping with Hitler's final will and testament, Goebbels was named Chancellor in Hitler's stead, but Goebbels, too, would die by suicide along with his family. As predicted, Berlin fell to the Allies with an unconditional surrender from the Germans eight days later, and one of the worst moments in world history had finally come to a close. A family rift? A secret death? You might have heard of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, but who changed his diapers? Keep watching to learn about the woman whose identity is a tightly guarded state secret. Kim Jong-un, the supreme leader of the Democratic Republic of North Korea, is one of the most famous public figures across the world. However, despite his infamy, the backstory of his lineage remains under the radar. While his father was Kim Jong-il, the previous leader of North Korea, information about his mother, Ko Yong-wi, is a secret, according to the New York Times. The mystery around her has continued even after her death in 2004. According to NK News, a media website run by North Korean defectors, part of the reason Ko remains out of the spotlight is because her in-laws did not approve of her. For starters, she had been working as an actress and dancer when she first met Kim Jong-il in the 1970s. The rift between Ko and her in-laws was apparently bitter enough that Kim Jong-un sought revenge on behalf of his mother following his ascension to the chairmanship. According to the New York Times, Kim blamed his uncle for aggravating the bad blood and had him executed in 2013. That said, Ko had a bigger so-called shortcoming in the eyes of the North Korean elite, a half-Japanese bloodline. Though North Korea, South Korea, and Japan are neighbors geographically, they share a bitter history with one another. The Korean Peninsula was colonized by Japan in 1910 after years of aggression, but the term colonization does not fully describe the all-out culture war that Japan waged against the Korean people. For example, the Korean language was forbidden in schools and public places, and historical documents were routinely burned. Things only got worse when World War II started. Japanese families were given the farms and properties of Koreans. Meanwhile, Korean men were trafficked to different islands to become laborers, while women were trafficked as comfort women, which is a nice way of saying forced unpaid sex workers. Their existence is bitterly contested by the Japanese. In fact, it is possible that Ko was the product of a comfort woman's time with a Japanese man, though this is pure speculation. Other sources have claimed that Ko actually was the daughter of a Japanese woman and a Korean laborer who had been sent to Osaka to work in a sewing factory. However, what is known is that she was born in Japan and of half Japanese and half Korean heritage. This alone made her undesirable due to her connection to a country widely considered at the time to be Korea's chief historical oppressor. While it seems as if the solution to Ko's background was to keep her out of the spotlight, there were some attempts to recuperate her image starting in 2002. That said, most of this publicity push was reserved for the small circles of North Korea's elite instead of the population at large. Part of this was because Ko had achieved enough fame in her youth as a dancer that her name, and thus her link to Japan, was recognizable. According to NK News, this issue was skirted by referring to Ko as the, quote, respected mother of Kim Jong-un and his siblings, or as the, quote, comrade of Kim Jong-il. They were all titles that conveniently didn't use her name. The focus on loyalty to North Korea and her husband served a second purpose, demonstrating a successful tale of anti-Japanese struggle. Though Ko may have been referred to as a mother, little is actually known about her relationship with her son, Kim Jong-un. 
The best descriptions available come from Coe's sister and brother-in-law, who defected to the United States after Coe's death. In an interview with the Washington Post, Coe's sister painted a picture of both normalcy and paradox. In some ways, Kim Jong-un seemed like a normal boy, especially during his time at a boarding school in Switzerland. Kim's aunt described how Ko would take Kim Jong-un to Disneyland Tokyo and how she indulged his passions, such as his obsession with basketball. However, Ko's sister also noted how Ko found it difficult to punish her son, especially when he began to realize his position of power in the North Korean regime. She recalled, He wasn't a troublemaker, but he was short-tempered and had a lack of tolerance. When his mother tried to tell him off for playing with these things too much and not studying enough, he wouldn't talk back, but he would protest in other ways, like going on a hunger strike. From that moment, Ko says, Kim's behavior changed. Despite the secrecy surrounding Ko's background, motherhood, and life in general, some reports have claimed that she pulled a lot of strings behind the scenes. North Korean experts have noted that Ko acted as the first lady of North Korea from the 1990s and onwards, despite her relatively mysterious persona. However, there was evidence that Ko had more clout than previously realized. They predicted his downfall. But Kim Jong-un has defied the odds and survived as leader of North Korea. She managed to position her own son as the heir to the North Korean regime, rather than Kim Jong-il's oldest son from his first wife. This son, Kim Jong-nam, was originally considered to be the successor before being sidelined in 2001. He was exiled from the country in 2003 and four years later was assassinated in Malaysia, according to The Guardian. Why would the young dictator of North Korea want to kill his own brother? Though it seemed that the North Korean government had been attempting a mild publicity push for Ko in the early 2000s, it was a short-lived endeavor as Ko died in 2004. The details around her death are as murky as those surrounding her life. According to The Mirror, most sources believe she died in Paris of an illness, most often reported as breast cancer. However, other reports have claimed that she simply was treated for her mysterious illness in Paris and managed to return to Pyongyang in the late spring or summer of 2004. Those reports claim she fell into a coma and died that August. It is believed that Ko's death was not widely publicized in North Korea, and Kim Jong-il publicly moved on with a new partner, Kim Jong-suk, after her passing. After Kim Jong-il died in 2011, Ko's name became a state secret, ensuring that future generations will likely know as little about her as known today. Eighty years after Adolf Hitler's murderous reign, the horrors he created continued to astonish. These lesser-known facts about the Nazi dictator shed light on the depth of his evil. It wasn't enough for Hitler and the Nazi leadership to kill millions of people. They took their evil a step further by making use of the body parts of their victims. Upon arrival at a concentration camp, a prisoner's hair was shaved off. This was a way to dehumanize Jews and other captives, but there was more than one reason behind it. The hair would be cured above a camp's crematorium and then gathered into bales. From there, it was spun into thread and used for making rope for ships, stuffing mattresses, and even making detonator cords for time-delayed bombs. But there were even creepier uses for the hair-infused thread. It was woven into the clothing of Nazi troops. The fibers were used in socks for sailors stationed on submarines, as a lining in uniforms, and as insulating material for cold weather boots. Moreover, the use of the hair was such a priority that camp personnel were required to submit periodic reports on the amount of hair collected. Piles of unused hair still remain today and are displayed in museums as a grim reminder of the immense scale and barbarity of the Nazi death camps. We are in the most efficient, or at least one of the most efficient, killing fields ever created by mankind. The fact that Nazi leadership felt no shame over using the hair of their prisoners for clothing and other items illustrates how completely their warped mindset saw Jews and other so-called undesirables as less than human. Hitler didn't just rely on physical torture in Nazi concentration camps, but psychological torture as well. One of the most gut-wrenching examples of the latter was forcing slave laborers to sing and dance for the guards' entertainment, as revealed in Music and Torture and Nazi Sites of Persecution and Genocide in Occupied Poland. In the paper, one former prisoner recalled how the Nazis forced women to sing while they executed male prisoners, many of whom were their friends and family. The survivor remembered the scene punctuated with the sound of gunshots intermingled with the melodies of the forced songs. I remember singing Madame Butterfly at 3 o'clock in the morning for, for a bunch of SS who were very tired of killing people. Songs were often a daily ritual as part of the afternoon roll call. This meant prisoners would sing and dance after spending the day completing tasks such as cleaning blood off gas chamber walls or sorting through the clothing of dead Jews. One survivor is quoted saying, I am aghast. They kill people there, in the chamber, and we are to sing. 
Worse, many of the songs were written specifically for the prisoners and included lyrics that cruelly mocked their fates. At Treblinka, an extermination camp that killed around 925,000 Jews and an untold number of Poles, Roma, and Soviet POWs, prisoners were forced to sing an anthem with the lyrics, Because our fate is Tarara, that's why we're in Treblinka today and sent here for this short time. Though children are generally considered the most innocent and helpless members of society, the Nazis had no shame in torturing and killing babies, toddlers, and kids. In fact, members of the regime often actually targeted children. There were two sick reasons behind the policy. The first was that children were a drain on resources and had little to no value as laborers. The Nazis couldn't make a profit off their child prisoners. And as the Nazis were obsessed with creating an Aryan master race, anyone else of reproductive age or who could reproduce in the future had to be exterminated. As explained by the Holocaust Encyclopedia, children posed a particular threat to the Nazis' plan to annihilate the Jewish people, because were they to survive, they would grow up to parent a new generation of Jews. Children were often the first to be condemned to death in the camps, and were sometimes driven away as their parents watched. This horror was recreated in a heart-wrenching scene in the film Sophie's Choice. Women who were pregnant or of childbearing age were treated similarly, and often sent to the gas chambers first, as part of the Nazi selection or selection process. One of the most striking facts of World War II is that Hitler decided to prioritize killing Jews and other prisoners over saving Germany. Professor Jordan Peterson pointed out that when they realized they were losing the war, the Nazis diverted troops and resources from the front lines to execute the final solution. Leadership would have to have questioned the value of continuing to exterminate prisoners while suffering defeat after defeat on the battlefield. The controversial Peterson added that the logical move would have been to keep as many prisoners alive as possible for slave labor in the support of the Third Reich. Peterson laid out the two options facing German commanders, saying, you can suspend your strategically unnecessary demolition of people, win the war, and then pick it up afterwards. Or, while you're losing, you can just accelerate the mayhem, even though it's counterproductive. But even though pausing the murder of concentration camp prisoners might have helped the Nazis temporarily stave off defeat, Hitler and the other Nazi officials decided that their hatred of Jews and other non-Aryan people trumped their desire for victory. It was a pathologically evil decision. Hitler found it cruel to consume meat and was a vegetarian, though it's been speculated that he sometimes indulged in a sausage or two. In fact, Nazi Germany enacted scores of animal rights laws and even established one of the first international conferences on animal protection. It is forbidden to force feed poultry. It is forbidden to abandon your pet. German schools were required to have curriculums focused on the humane treatment of animals, and medical researchers were severely restricted when it came to animal testing. Meanwhile, scientists in concentration camps performed gruesome human experiments without issue. It gets worse. The Nazi party was the first governing body in the world to pass laws to protect animals used in film, and animal abusers were sentenced to up to two years in prison if found guilty. Heinrich Himmler, the mastermind of the extermination camps, even asked his doctor and avid hunter, how can you find pleasure in shooting from behind at poor creatures browsing on the edge of a wood. It is really murder. In his manifesto, Mein Kampf, Hitler admitted that he would give some of his food to mice if they looked like they were hungry. It's hard to fathom how Hitler and the Nazi regime were able to fret about the ethics of horse racing, yet were monstrous enough to encourage horrors such as throwing babies directly into ovens. 